If I could invite our eminent panel of commentators to maybe make their way back into the audience, because we're about to have a wrap-up session, except for Herman, who's going to join us for the wrap-up. Thank you so much. And as you go, let me offer a reflection on that very question, because, um, uh, you know, working with Suncorp IEG, Swiss Re, Munich Re, uh, first of all, uh, to correct Phil, you're not the only one. Uh, Greg Johnson from Stockholm, after doing that work in a deliberate way since 2013, put the entire commercial portfolio up for reinsurance again last year and got a $165,000 reduction in the premium on the basis of recognizing the adaptive infrastructure that systematically was invested in. So that's one touch point. Secondly, one thing that Phil said around insurance signals and how slow it is to get them. So if people who live up north and happen to own a strata title unit on the coast, you know, are listening, then they'd be able to confirm that what used to cost $5,000 a year to insure now costs $27,000 a year to insure. And who lives in those little apartment buildings? Often retirees who can barely afford to pay the old insurance. Why did that happen? Because of Yassi. What is going to happen in Southeast Queensland when we do cop the next big one? Our insurance premiums are going to go through the roof. What is Suncorp doing about it? Google protecting the north. It's the world's first incentive program for retrofitting existing buildings with research calibrated measures that reduce exposure and vulnerability. And if you take measures to retrofit your home or commercial property, the idea is that Suncorp will actually reward you with a reduced premium. And they're now building the information base around that. Why are they doing that? Because they don't want their business to disappear. And insurance is becoming uninsurable in North Queensland. And that is the canary. We are next in Southeast Queensland. OK, so wonderful. Um, we thought we would finish this very interesting day of reflection by inviting a number of people uh, from the audience who are now you know, in the room to just offer their reflections of the day and you know, some, some key points of reflection. And um, I'm going to ask perhaps Pete to ensure that the mic roams around in the right way. But Abel, Imraj, if we could offer, invite you to comment. And we, 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 we've asked Abel to really, standing from 2036 and looking with a bit of hind casting, what were the three big things that made Brisbane more resilient to a major flood? Um, and how did we bounce back better than in the past? We prepared, we responded, and we recovered. By preparing, there's a, an imperative on all of us in this room and those that are beyond this to take on the responsibility that we've been vested with, which is in 2016, we have the ability to get ourselves organized and create the right sort of environment where the community of that future would be able to respond and recover. And I think some of the things you talked about, some of the market-based mechanisms, if people won't invest in the future because it's uncertain or unknown, that's where the value proposition goes out to the market and let those people that have the ability to invest will make those investments in return for that risk. So I think we, in this current generation, should be creating those sort of value propositions for the future. We, we can create that through our preparation. The recovery and the response, which we've talked about, a lot of technology will enable us to recover better and respond better. And I think the job that we're creating in that preparations, uh, preparation phase is to think about the sort of comfort, comfort that the future generations have in living with those sort of technologies. They make decisions differently, and they're able to um, anticipate things quicker than we can, and that's the important thing. We don't constrain that in the way we prepare. I owe a great debt of gratitude to the Brisbane River Story book, which uh, Helen Gregory uh, put out, because when you look back and see what we did to the river, and there's a whole chapter on using the river, apart from the ones relating to finding the river. And there's a whole story in there. What we did to the river is, is, is phenomenally, and the, the things we've heard about today are nothing compared to what we've done in the past. But somewhere things changed, and we need to now get to the same stage of protecting the river and making sure that it's able to sustain us. 
Thank you very much, Abel. Um, Herman, you know, what have you observed here today? And I guess, what are the most important flood management opportunities that we have? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I was asked last night to uh, make some observations on this uh, hypothetical. Uh, I'll do that uh, by the few presentations of this morning. There I could make some notes. This afternoon it was a bit difficult to make notes uh, with your back on the screen and the, you know, looking at the back of the speaker. So, but for the, I have some concluding remark on all those four uh, presentations of the afternoon. But first of all, uh, the presentations of this morning. I think Blair, he made clear that uh, high variability is here to stay where it comes to rainfall uh, and that climate change within the time span of some 25 years will not make go a large difference. Uh, Al Gore said, uh, he talked about climate change, uh, an inconvenient truth. What I encounter in my work uh, with flood risk management, quite often climate change is used as a convenient excuse for not doing something more in the field of economic development or, or land use change. And Catherine, she uh, explained about the high dynamics in urban areas, um, that things can change within a relatively short period, uh, if you have the vision and the will to, to do that. Uh, uh, making also clear that greening the city infrastructure is, an, is a large challenge, but it come up with other concepts like uh, cities as catchments. It made me a little bit think about uh, a concept that I encountered in Taiwan, like the sponge city, taking care that cities are more flood resilient. Mark, he explained uh, the difficulty in uh, the concept of flood probability. And there was one uh, remark that uh, uh, I re registered very well. He said, insurance is a privilege and not a right. Well, in the Netherlands, uh, insurance is an impossibility. Uh, <laughs> every 10 years or so, uh, the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Infrastructure and the insurance industry get together, talk for a while, form a task force, and at the end they conclude you're not going for all those transaction costs and, uh, well, up till the next time then. Um, Michel Raymond, he had a very nice uh, presentation showing about the genesis of, uh, of floods um, and also showing how the operation of the dam is uh, tuned to the distribution of the rainfall and the distribution of the uh, um, floods, especially taking into account the downstream part of the, of the catchment and also indicating that about 50% of the catchment is not uh, being controlled uh, and that they have, well, to, to tune their uh, discharge policies to that situation downstream of the dam. For the uh, afternoon sessions, I'm not going to sum up uh, what is said, but if I hear all the stories, there was one question that came up in my mind all the time, and that is, what arguments or what motiva motivation do you need more? To, uh, to go for a more preventive approach. Uh, uh, I think there are many arguments uh, why that should be, uh, should be done. I mentioned earlier all there are a number of uh, low regret measures that you could take and the ones I mentioned, they come out of an application in European Union. Uh, there was a flood risk directive, an ESA flood risk directive. And all the member states, they have uh, carried out flood risk analysis. Uh, mapped the floods and made some flood risk management. And there were a couple of uh, low, rhetoric, low regret measures that came out of this, uh, this exercise. The early warning systems that could be improved. Identify and map hotspots for flash floods, which is also very important here, but also for instance last year in France, in the south of France, that also cost a loss, cost the life of about 20 people. To safeguard the retention areas in spatial planning and to uh, restore and maintain the natural retention areas uh, within the basin. Uh, the question is, and of course, on how do you achieve that? And of course, it's hard for me to say that in the uh, Australian context, but 
what I think in Europe and in Netherlands we found is that it is very important to analyze these kind of things on a river basin scale. Uh, and that you need to enhance the water governance uh, to uh, maybe have a river basin authority to actually carry out such uh, analysis. And that it is important to link the flood mitigation to the regional uh, development objectives in the area. And earlier, and that's to conclude my comments, earlier you made a comment on wisdom and river, and that made me think of an expression that I came across when I worked in Indonesia. It was on the island of Java, who was the king of Kalungo, and he said to his son, to reach your objective, follow the course of a river that meanders. It may not be a straight route, but it will be pleasing and beautiful. So, no worries. Surely it is pleasing and beautiful. If we could get a mic to the back row uh, towards the right. So um, we've invited Mike Ronan, who, who is with the Department of Environment and Heritage. And of course, that means he is a servant of the government. But we're in 2036. And Mike already is, you know, a happy godfather to many grandchildren. And so loosen up your view, Mike, of, I guess, that critical question. What will it take? for us to invest in those ecosystem services over the next 20 years that really minimize the water flow, the damage, the input, et cetera, and create all of those other multiple benefits that will make us so much more prosperous. I think the, um, my reflection on it is that uh, the, and it really came out of um, Mike's, uh, Mike Reynolds' presentation, is that there's just not a collective view and understanding of how these systems work. Um, and uh, without that collective view and understanding of, of how the catchment works, uh, it's very hard to actually um, understand the values that come out of that uh, catchment the ecosystem services that come out of it. Uh, I think we've been very good in terms of, and we talked a lot about technologies and uh, great uh, new data getting uh, pushed out to people. People are saturated with data and information, and uh, I think what we really need to do if we want to get uh, those values recognized uh, is to actually get the kind of products out that will engage the community, that will empower the community, and let them understand how the system works. Because we're, we've been doing work in Southeast Queensland with the Council of Mayors through the Resilient Rivers, in, in combination with the Resilient Rivers program, uh, with the SEQ catchments, healthy waterways, uh, SEQ water and others. And we've done probably about six or seven of these uh, la walking the landscape processes. And we just find that even though people are working in the catchment, there is not a collective understanding. And if you want to, as I say, fix that system, get, get it really um, resilient, there has to be that, that understanding, and it's just not there. I think the other thing is that uh, a lot of the decisions, a lot of the things we do as humans are done at a site scale. Uh, Floods and uh, water processes are processes, and as humans, we don't deal very well with processes. They kind of come and they go and they move around. We want to kind of stop things. We live in particular places, and uh, trying to deal with these, uh, these things that only happen once in a, a blue moon, we're not good at. And we have to look at ways uh, in the future that we can recognize how, how to deal with those things that only happen once, once in a blue moon. Um, I suppose the other thing, um, the last thing I'd like to say is that, um, you know, technologies can change, um, and they will change, but when it comes to water movement in a catchment and the floods that will happen, uh, they will happen in the future. They're, they're, um, it's, it's basically water moving uh, down, down the hill. Um, it's been absorbed, it's, uh, you've got human infrastructure that affects it, and you've got the natural system that affects it. We can change any of those parameters, or some of those parameters, but ultimately floods are going to happen in the future. And what we have to do is to try and recognize the natural features and human 
activities that we can do in that catchment to try and maximize the ecosystem services that we get out of it. But, but it has to be done uh, in, a, in a, an integrated way. And without that collective understanding, it's not being done in an integrated way. We're making decisions on infrastructure, on environment, on um, all kinds of other decisions as if they're in isolation to each other, but one affects the other. So unless we have an integrated process, um, I think it, we're going to have a major problem recognizing uh, natural capital and ecosystem services. Those are wonderful insights. Thank you so much for sharing them. Um, as we invite two additional uh, people to uh, speak up with their thoughts, please gather your ideas because we have another 10, 15 minutes where we very much welcome thoughts from the audience about the day. And uh, I hear an appetite for further collaboration. I think that's, uh, that's critical. So Mark Pasco, can you kindly first introduce yourself uh, to the audience and then share with us your sense of whether we might prosper through this event even better than we did through 74. Th thanks, Mara. Mark Pasco is my name. I'm from the International Water Center. Uh, I'm, I'm also at the moment chairing uh, the, one of the water ministers' uh, panels, uh, expert panels on water. And just yesterday afternoon, uh, in, one of the, in that expert panel meeting, there was a thing we wrote down in, in, in some advice to the minister which has been, I think, reinforced uh, today, and that's this notion, you just used the word, Mara, and, and, and Mike did as well, uh, uh, collaboration. I think we will have uh, been more successful in dealing or managing uh, a, a 2036 flood because we, we joined a whole lot of dots together across our, our institutions. Uh, this this room is 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 full of those people who, who who somehow, if we were able to synthesise, uh, you know what's in the heads and uh, of you guys and your activities into into a flood management plan for for Brisbane, then uh, we'd we'd do it for a 2020 flood. Um, so I'm I'm. I'm imploring us collectively to somehow um, join our organisations together. And maybe, maybe we do need, uh, I think this, uh, there was a suggestion somewhere this morning uh, about a, you know, a Brisbane something or other group. We've had various Brisbane groups before. Uh, in fact, I've been involved in a number of them. Uh, but, but I think we, 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 we don't do that integration well yet. Uh, I think we still still have that as a challenge. I think one of the other things we will have done is is and Mike and others have said it as well is engage influence and involve uh, the the community uh, and uh, yes we're we're thirsty we're thirsty for information I'm a bit tragic with devices and you know, want to look at um, all, all sorts of information, but I think by 2036 we will have will have been able to to have the smarts in the Internet of Things to have have synthesised that, and maybe we'll have devices in our in our bodies. Um, uh, in in 20 years' time, I'll probably have a few. <laughs> uh, but I was around for the 1974 flood. In fact, I was working for Brisbane City Council then actually just near you and at the Oxley Creek wastewater treatment plant and the laboratories there went 15 feet underwater uh, and we killed some cattle from the uh, DPI down the road. Uh, I then watched uh, the, the, the 2011 flood from the seventh floor apartment where we live in Roma Street Parklands and saw the Oxley's uh, restaurant float past. Um, I, yeah, I hope not to see all those things floating past then. The, the, the next time, uh, and to your point of hold on to the pontoons, uh, but but we won't have achieved that I don't think until we've we've until the community really understands this, and this is a huge challenge when we're starting to talk about to the property point to property values. Uh, we actually badly want to forget the floods as quickly as we can, uh, so that we can get out and sell that house in some cases. Um, anyway, I think we will have done a better job. Uh, in 2036 than, 
than we've than we've done in the past because we've connected things together better. Thank you so much. How optimistic, um, David, Fagan. If I could invite you to, uh, I guess, cap off on this emerging theme of uh, how do we collaborate? Because we're clearly not going to get through this working independently. Thanks very much, Mara. Um, I think the magic word that keeps arising today is this word of resilience. And it, it arises in many contexts, doesn't it? Uh, we, we, we're told we have to teach our children to be resilient. Um, and we, we talk about resilience in the context of rivers. But it really is quite an appealing word. But what does it mean in terms of engaging the public? Because to make this work, the public really has to engage. It's one thing for the water professionals or the planning professionals, but the public has to, to see the value and importance of, of this. And you know, so often, rightly or wrongly, it does come back to this, this economic value. And uh, I revealed my past before as a, as a journalist and headline writer, and I, I, I often recede to that way of thinking. And I put together two pieces of information from this afternoon. One was that if we clean up Lockyer Creek, you can uh, uh, credit um, you can say that would reduce peak flood levels in a serious flood in Brisbane by half a metre. And the other was that if we spend $20 million a year for 20 years on cleaning up Lockyer Creek and the rest of the catchment, um, well, we, we will have achieved that. So $20 million a year to reduce peak flood levels half a metre sounds like a like pretty good economic value to me. And I think that's aside from the nice feeling of resilience and the value of resi resilience, it's a very powerful argument to make to governments and to the public. I think people will see that. And again, going back to my journalistic heritage, when you're chasing a story, you go to where the money is and who's got the money to, to be putting in $20 million a year? Well, it's the people who are going to save it. It's um, governments who are going to re reduce their restoration costs and insurance companies who are going to be able to keep their premiums competitive. So I think that's a, a really important way to think about this. Um, I think your question was, how does QUT catalyse this? I think uh, credit to Piet, he's, he's done so much already to, to catalyse a group of people. And you know, those of us who are from QUT know how often we come to events and, and we start off acknowledging that the role of the traditional owners, uh, the uh, people who, who have lived here for many, many, 35,000 generations, I think. And one of the things we, we always say is that this has always been a place of learning. And I think today is a great illustration of what a terrific place of learning, learning this is. And not learning by sitting here listening to someone go blah, 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 but learning by participating, by really uh, engaging in the discussion and, and being able to share knowledge of great value. Um, and, uh, and the collaborations that's come through from that from the government instrumentalities, from business, from the, all of the universities uh, in this part of the world, I think is a really good starting point uh, and something we should be able to build on from here. Fantastic, so please continue to gather your thoughts. If you were on the panel, if you were a speaker, if you're a member of the audience, we have 15 minutes now to share our reflections for the day. And Anne, I see you are eager. Just one little idea we had when we began Oxley Creek in 1995. We couldn't see any reason why everyone in Brisbane wouldn't know which catchment they were in. And I can remember, you know, begging the council, one particular gentleman, every time I'd see him, say, can't you put the name of the catchment on the rate notices? People would learn all about catchments. They might see the word. I know we use catchments in relations to schools. People are getting used to that. So perhaps we could use catchment in, on rate notices in local councils. Thank you. That seems exceedingly pragmatic. <laughs> Sir, please uh, introduce yourself. Can we get a mic up there? Is it possible to be good to on. capture. Yeah. Oh, we've got one down here, and then I'll bring mine up to you. So first, please, okay, um, Mike. Michael Raymond, uh, just looking back on the flood, and just to Tony's word about just be careful with flood levels half a metre lower and bollocks. <laughs> um, totally agree. Trees along the waterways, really good. Slows down the floods, traps the sediment, 
we can't put numbers on it though around flood levels and we need to be careful about putting words around expecting flood level reduction. It will slow the floods, it will also trap debris, so you cannot say with any certainty that we can rely on that for flood level reduction, but totally support the idea of trees on the catchments. The other one is people grip, struggled with resilience. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. You just have to think about what will happen if it happens again, can I avoid it? And Australians have been doing resilience for years. We did, it started it decades and decades ago. We used to have dirt roads all over the place. The roads kept falling apart from the traffic. So what did we do? We put bitumen on it and it made the roads resilient. Think along those lines and you'll get resilience. Okay, uh, right. so I'm James Udy, I've uh, been uh, Chief Scientist at Healthy Waterways for about five years and I've recently left, um, or well, working with Healthy Waterways still, but as uh, Director of Science Under Sail, a new initiative doing science while you're also sailing. So I'm actually hoping come 2036 I'll be on my sailboat off the coast and I can watch this on the news. Um, but I guess having worked in the industry for so long and an interesting point even the insurers who I always hold up there as a group that probably will actually push us to do the right thing just for economic reasons, even, you know, they're still basing their premiums on what's happened in the past and how many claims you made in the last five or ten years rather than looking at your risk profile going forward very well. We, we heard that. I'm sure there's exceptions. And I reflect on my own five years um, experiences and I hope the future holds what Mark posed to us in that we have genuine integration and collaboration across organisations. But I have noticed organisations and individuals often have a resistance to change and business as usual is a lot easier than um, actually doing something different or coming up with an innovative new idea. So I guess my cynic hat on, I'd actually expect the 2036 flood to give a really big spike to the GDP of South East Queensland because the insurers are going to invest big and it'll be almost as good as the uh, mining boom when it was on. We'll have a lot of work there to rebuild but paid for out of uh, the previous insurance premiums. What I'm hoping will happen though is in 2036 they will look back and say, hey, it was really great to see that those people like me who by then will be retired um, actually work together to combine investment for infrastructure and the catchments so that we weren't investing money on roads or catchment works or reducing flood risk or water quality, but we'd actually worked out how to, and like Mike Ronan put it, actually integrate the processes at the appropriate scale that we need and we were focusing our investment on risk reduction that gave other benefits along the ways rather than this piecemeal thing where you do something to get past the DA tick box. Um, so yeah, I won't bore you much longer, but I guess, and I have, and Jim um, Smart's talk, I think that focusing on moving from grey infrastructure investment to green infrastructure investment and actually making the right arguments to the right people about the economic benefits, and we've started to try and do that around the potential, so the opportunity cost for South East Queensland around ecosystems and their use for tourism uh, and growth, and also the community health, which I haven't heard today, but those sorts of improvements that actually lead to better community health, both in physical sense and mental health, where if you properly manage your waterways to reduce flood risk, will also give you an ongoing asset that you use every day as you get to work, and I think there was a beautiful photo of a bike ride path. So. I'll um, end on that, thanks. Th thank you, no, that's wonderful. And uh, Michelle Anderson from RACQ, I believe is with us today. Feel free to slide past incognito, or if you'd like to respond, we also welcome views. I am a great fan of the insurance industry as it is one of the key drivers of change in this uh, equation. Now having said that, Hamid, please, we welcome your, and, and please introduce yourself for the audience. Sure. Um, hi everyone, my name is Hamid Mirfenderesk from Gold Coast City Council. Uh, I just wanted to touch base on two issues that, uh, in my view, there are gaps and we didn't talk to, about them today. It's risk, first, first of all, uh, mm, risk communication. Uh, on the first presentation this afternoon, it, there was a bit of talk about community safety, but when it comes to the communication of risk, communication of data was basically, or information, 
uh, used as a surrogate to communication of risk, there is a huge difference between data and risk communication. Hardly can I think of any data that is good to give to people during a flood emergency. <clears throat> and uh, there were talk about you know, cloud and uh, sensors and internet and all these things. If you do a literature, on, literature review on risk communication, hardly can you find anything. And my experience during flood emergency has been that we have serious problems with risk communication during emergency. And on the risk communication, outside an emergency situation, again, uh, there was talk about, yeah, there is a 100% certainty that uh, a house will be flooded during a 100-year flood for during its uh, mortgage. They are all correct, but if you want to have a proper risk communication and proper actions, we need to be a bit more holistic and consider all natural hazards. For instance, on the Gold Coast, uh, if you put all the natural hazard maps on top of each other, and also the areas that would have um, uh, uh, development would have significant adverse impact on environment, you might, I think we, we are left with five or six percent of the city that you can build. So pushing people from one hazard area eventually results in putting them in another uh, hazard area. And with the climate change, for example, I think that bushfire, um, the risk profile of the cities are changing. In the Gold Coast, bushfire is becoming far more important than flood. I mean, the impact of climate change on extreme events is highly uncertain, and I'm not relying on them yet. But on the mean values, is, has far more certainty. Temperature is going up, mean rainfall, mean rainfall is coming down, bushfire risk is becoming huge. You are seeing it in South Australia, in uh, Victoria, and our growth is in bushfire area at the moment. <laughs> and the second point that I wanted to mention here, talking about resilience, I think the main element that we are missing here on building resilience is ignoring residual risk. We all talk about uh, just existing risk and maybe future risk. What is residual risk? We are protecting ourselves against certain risk. Say, for example, one in 100 year flood. We don't do beyond that because it's expensive. We would not have money to do anything else. So up to one in 100, we are protected. Anything beyond that, we are not. I did a bit of calculation in the context of Gold Coast. I think it would be valid for many cities. In the, I basically draw the spectrum of risk. 40% of risk is associated with 100 or less. 60% is associated with more than 100. So 60% of the risk that we have is because of residual risk. So, our, the 40%, which is our risk against you know, the design natural hazard event, is not going to change as long as we, have, we are implementing our regulations. They are all set to maintain this. But our residual risk is increasing as we speak. Every asset that you are building in a city that is growing, 40% of risk is addressed through complying with laws and regulations and plans. And 60% of risk is not addressed because we are complying with the laws and regulation and plans. So somehow this residual risk needs to be addressed. Traditionally, residual risk has been addressed by emergency management. They say this is, emerg this is the risk that we are accepting and we are overwhelmed with flood and or bushfire. Emergency people go and save people and insurance pay for the damage. I don't think it's going to work. It means this approach has resulted in having substantial unfunded liability. If 2011 flood occurs, I don't think anybody can pay again for all the damages. And it's getting worse. The, all I can say is it's an unfunded uh, liability. Somehow this residual risk needs to be addressed and we are missing opportunity one after another. Because 
Another issue that we are not dealing with that properly is getting our engineers and planners to work a bit more with each other. Our engineers doing a lot of capital work to manage existing risks. We manage existing risk, create a lot of resilience, and for instance, by lowering flood, pla flood planning level, because now flood level has come down, basically losing our resilience. So if we are doing mitigation, I, I, I tried very hard during the uh, 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 production of estate planning policy to convince our officers in the state government that we should talk about unmitigated flood. If you are mitigating, it should be maintained. You should not let that mitigation to be eroded by development. I managed to convince 12 councillors, all councillors in Gold Coast, I couldn't convince our state government officers. So addressing residual risk is, uh, to me is the key issue to gaining resilience within urban area. I'm not talking about resilience in catchment, that's a different story, but within urban area, that's the important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. And um, can, can I say, I've uh, had the pleasure of being on the flood uh, advisory group for Goko City Council, and it is quite insane that a group of engineers managed to implement the third level of the Hins Dam but not allow the developers, therefore, to develop away. <laughs> so they held on to the resilience of that additional level on the dam by holding on to the planning rules. Now that is an incredible achievement in a very politically dynamic area, so my hat's off to Hamid and his team. Um, who else would like to share their reflections? Please, and introduce yourself. And I come from the University of Southern Queensland. Um, I have just finished a PhD on how people get information in a disaster. And I just wanted to touch on a point that Hamid mentioned about risk communication, which was that we have all this data that we need to transmit. But really, people just want to know how it's going to affect them. So they'll find out about a flood or a flash flood from other people, and then they'll go and find someone who's experienced who can tell them what 13.4 metres at the bridge is going to mean for their own house. So it's pretty basic. We just have to get that translation nailed. And most of the communicators in this room will be able to do that. The other point I noticed from Emerge from today was um, that the effects on Brisbane are dramatically increased by what goes on outside the Brisbane City Council area. Um, and it was brought home to me in the Lockyer Valley floods when I was sitting in the dis local disaster management committee and um, this, it was crystallised by Jim's presentation. The councillors wanted to grade all of the trees out of the creeks so the water could disappear more quickly. And I just think that this sort of forum it would be really important to involve those outlying stakeholders who have such power. Thank you for those comments. I know there were some gentlemen in this third row that might want to share some observations. Is now a good time? Please. There you go, thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Tony Pearce. I'm the Inspector General for Emergency Management, not the Queensland one, which is him. I'm the Victorian one. Um, just a, a couple of observations, I guess, just in relation to what's going on in Victoria in this, this hypothetical today. Um, something we've been driving fairly hard is this concept since 2009, the bushfires, is this concept of shared responsibility, which is about, about the community as well as government and business and so on having a role to play in this. And what we've discovered along the way is that we're actually not good at community engagement at all. We talk about it, we use, we use the phrase plenty and in an ad hoc splintered way, different groups and different departments go out and talk to different communities about different things but we have no strategy or otherwise across the state as to how we do that, and nor have we recognised it as a major influencer on, on policy. The other problem we then have is, and, and a comment made earlier today about the four-year cycle or the political cycle, is that whether we like it or not, that is a reality. 
And as public service organisations and agencies that work with public service organisations, we are developing policy along the way that we believe is going to deliver a better outcome for communities. But whether we like it or not, if we don't learn how to change the language and synthesise what we know into a story that we can sell to politicians, that political cycle is going to continue to impact upon our ability to actually make real change for the communities. And if we don't learn how to engage with them in a structured way, as in the community that is, then we're actually not going to know what we're trying to synthesise to sell to the politicians. So what we've been, I've been saying in Victoria is that one of the things that we have to learn to do better is to learn how to be storytellers. Because if you can't give a politician something that they can stand up sometime in that four years and wave around that shows tangibly that they've made a difference for community along the way, then you're not going to be able to sell it. And we all know that many of the policies that we need to see implemented over the next number of years, which also apply to your 2036 scenario, are not actually things that you can hold up and wave around that will make a difference to votes. So I think we've got a lot of work to do in the context of community engagement and um, um, I just think it's something we've got to give a lot more thought to in a, con in a coordinated way, I guess. Okay, very good. Yes, please, Richard. Um, Richard might be our last comment. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on something Tony said because there's another element of what's happening in Victoria and one of those is around consequence management um, and particularly that much stronger focus on what is the consequence of the hazard rather than a focus on the hazard. Um, to take the sediment problem for example, if you turn the argument around to the community to say well one of the benefits of reducing the sediment flow in the river is you don't need the mud army after the flood then you've actually got a different story to tell from the one you're trying to tell, which is how, how do you manage the hazard. So it's, um, it's about how you frame the question when you're talking to the community to get the outcome you're looking for. Very good. Thank you for that. I found, I found, I found the insurance team. Yay! They're just here. <laughs> No, no, look, we'd, we've, we've done a lot of work with insurance colleagues um, in recent time in our flood community practice, so um, we certainly um, enjoy you being here. Would, was there a comment you wanted to make? I think I'll make this very, very brief. Um, you know, we talk about resilience and I think moving forward, you know, we've got, had a lot of discussion and there's a massive brains trust within this room. I think we need to coin that word or that phrase of, of resolve and find the resolve within ourselves to actually enable the discussion to continue so that we are good storytellers in the, uh, in the face of the government uh, representatives that we will need to meet and also the, the wider business community. So um, the enablement of that resolve is, I think, is the key question for us now. Look, that's, that's excellent. I am uh, going to hand back to Pete to uh, invite us for a drink and some, some capping reflections. But the wonderful thing about holding the mic at the end of an event is you get to share your own reflections for a few minutes. And I have one burning kind of thing which, um, you know, touches on these various issues of residual risk, of if we only understood some things, we would do things differently, of the small amounts that we could invest intelligently and how we can engage with the public to get political license to actually do things. And I've been observing the rise of something very, very important. And I encourage each of you to, to go home to your agencies, your jobs, and learn a little bit more about this. And it's called deliberative democracy. So it comes out of the Scandinavians 40 years ago. The Danish Board of Technology worked out that if you put complex policy, technical, scientific questions to ordinary citizens, not squeaky wheels, not advocates, not lobbyists, demographically representative ordinary citizens, if you immerse them in knowledge about what the issue at stake is, and if you empower them, there's that word, to actually influence the outcome, including how to spend money, often their own taxes. Incredible results come. In Australia, we have something called New Democracy Foundation, which is based in Sydney and has been working with all states, interestingly, other than Queensland until now, uh, a lot with Victoria and New South Wales. This is a body which is very deliberate at how they use these methodologies. On the board is Nick Greiner, the former Premier of New South Wales, Jeff Gallup, the former Premier of WA, 
Lucy Turnbull, for many years, has been represented on the board. It's funded by the family that owns Transfield, so very deep pockets on infrastructure, very clear on the outcomes on this. City of Melbourne recently put a $10 billion working capital budget up for decision by 100 randomly selected citizens. The age followed that process and how they learned and what they recommended, and the outcomes, Tony would know, are sensational. And I'm pretty sure Melbourne City Council has accepted around 95% of them. Imagine if we put $20 million aggregated across various agencies to a deliberative process with the goal of how to invest that to best build our resilience. Not only do you get a conversation going with the public, you'll get some really smart investment decisions. So on that happy note, in the spirit of collaboration, you might wonder how it is that my shirt is white again because I went into the toilet and there were some wonderful women there. <laughs> and together we were very, very resourceful. So all kinds of things are possible. Over to you, Pete. Oh, uh, there you go. Thank you, Mara. And, and a big round for Mara. Mara's sort of brought not just um, an opportunity for being an MC, but a huge amount of knowledge and long commitment to this particular area of resilience. And um, she was very, very happy to come on at, you know, just before Christmas I mentioned this was a bit of a project and she was a bit aghast that we might try and do it. But it's been a pleasure for me to work with her and I hope for you all a pleasure to have her look after us today. Thank you, Mara. But folks, um, one of the opportunities we're trying to explore is that we'd like to keep this conversation alive today. and. Um, Together with George and a few of us, we're actually going to try and give you a few scenarios to reflect on. And we'd like to challenge you to help give us some critique and pull these scenarios apart. Because I think, um, from my point of view, I reckon we've raised more questions today than we have answers. And um, the process of how we can share and engage, I think, is the door that we're opening today. Um, we've. I'm sure we've got your email somewhere, so we'll keep in touch. And if you don't, please, um, please be in touch with us. But essentially, over the, the next short time, we'll, we'll have something back out to you. And we'd like to, through our other friends from MindHive, and for those of you who might have been watching today, there's been a bit of a conversation going on the MindHive platform on a whole range of suggestions. And this particular discussion tool will be staying open for a while. So. If you go home and over the next few days still have some further thoughts, there's plenty of opportunities to there to think a little bit more into the future. Um, I would still challenge us that we're very good at still talking about what works well today and what, what, what doesn't work well today, but I'd really like to encourage to maybe give some thought of what's really going to happen over the next 20 years. You, you, for those of you here this morning, Jackie Trad, I think, was very much putting that offer to us all. So. Um, from QUT's um, team, we're happy to keep engaging you further. Um, thank you very much for staying on. A long day, and I, I really appreciate the diversity of folk that have come. We, I, I salute you because I think we learn from each other. And if you've got some time, we'd like you to come and join us in the Cube, where we've got some fantastic displays and interactions around water use, and there's a few cold drinks as well. So to you all, to the team up the back, to Terry and his guys who looked after all the AVs, thank you very much. To a great guy over here whose work you're going to see in all the various reports, Jimmy Patch. Jimmy has, has been fastidiously um, summarising everything that's been going on, and you can see some of his great work up here. Um, Jimmy, thanks very much. You've really added an extra edge today, so thank you, Jimmy. Okay, and no further ado, um, enjoy yourself to some hospitality. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>